Welcome to Health System CIO's interview with Eric Decker, Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer with Intermountain Healthcare. I'm Anthony Guerra, Founder and Editor-in-Chief. Eric, thanks for joining me. Thanks again. All right, great. Eric, you want to just briefly give us a quick overview of your organization and your role? Yeah, you bet. So uh, Eric Decker, I'm the VP and Chief Information Security Officer for Intermountain Healthcare. So Intermountain Healthcare is an integrated delivery network located in the Mountain West region. So uh, based in Salt Lake City, Utah, but we have Nevada, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, Kansas, and Montana in our portfolio. And being an integrated delivery network, we're also both a health plan as well as healthcare delivery. Very good, Eric. Uh, all right, I want to just uh, see what's on your mind. So what are some of the the top or most important trends that that you're looking at that you think CISOs should be uh, working on or preparing their organizations to handle? Yeah, so there's the, the the top issues that are happening today, of course, are still ransomware and still these attacks that have, uh, that have occurred. Unfortunately, there's been a several big ones that have hit in the last 30, 60 days or so. Uh, and, you know, as you look at how these intruders are getting into these systems, uh, it, it still is the basics. And, you know, so some of the, the, the trends that we need to be focusing on are hygiene, are, you know, minimum standards, minimum controls that should be in place that go against the most prevalent attack vectors. And so it's still multi-factor authentication on your VPN or the lack thereof on VPN or email, remote desktop open to the outside world critical vulnerabilities open on your perimeter. Yeah, these are things that are not, uh, they're not overly complex and, but the environments that we manage are overly complex. And sometimes these technologies can kind of work their way into the environment. You don't even know that they're there. And, and so having that like real good inventory, real, especially if you're doing acquisition work, merger and acquisition work, you know, really need to make sure that those uh, at least those five things are accounted for. Uh, on the 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 other item that I I still think about and what we do on the national level as part of the cyber working group of the Health Sector Coordinating Council is looking at third party and third party attacks. So it'd be attacks either against data that's held by our third parties or it's third parties being compromised and a conduit. Of attack flows through that third party. So maybe you have a, I mean, just a critical supplier that has a VPN connection into your organization, a backdoor IPsec, you know, tunnel, something along those lines. Uh, and if those if those third parties are compromised, there there are still plenty of intrusions that are happening, you know, via that vector. So you know, third party risk and looking at third party risk, not just from a sense of what data do they hold, but what kind of access does that third party have to your organization? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So a couple of things there. So the basics. So what you're doing everybody, I assume every CISO should be doing postmortems as much as they can when they read about a breach in the news, right? You read about a breach, a health system got breached. You want to read as much as you can about it, understand what yeah. happened. What's the lesson learned here? You're still seeing a lot of it's the basics. The basics yes. would have caught that. But to your point, the basics are simple, but complicated because of the size, the scope. As you said, it's growing. We just added this. We just added that. It's difficult to keep your arms around all that. So a little bit more on that and your thoughts around that. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it sounds easy and unfortunately it's not, especially when you have, you know, think about what a health, what a, what a cybersecurity department does for an organization. You know, we are we're trying to keep our lens on everything that's happening, everything that's changing on any given moment. If you have just a regular system that's not going through growth, that system is changing constantly. And so, you know, cyber teams are out there trying to make sure that as those changes happen, you're not introducing a vulnerability, you're not introducing a new vector of attack in and so forth. And so you get spread very thin, very quickly uh, as that's occurring. You know, I mentioned third party, there's a ton of contracting that organizations like ours do. And so a lot of resources get dedicated to that. A lot of resources get dedicated to your 24-7 monitoring. A lot of resources get dedicated to your IT projects, a lot of, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's hard. It's, or I should say it's easy to lose 
lose, uh, lose your lens on hygiene because you're thinking about all this other stuff. Uh, however, you know, it is, it is absolutely the way that, that most of the cyber attackers, the, the intruders are getting in is it's VPN access, it's compromised credentials, it's the fish, although the fish is kind of moving uh, away and, and it's going to go more towards back to towards vulnerability and exploit. Uh, but it's your perimeter and, you know, what kind of zero days or critical vulnerabilities are, are resident in your, in your perimeter and so forth. When you have, uh, if you're a smaller organization and you have limited resources, I would definitely say make sure that that stuff is locked up and, and it takes it takes resources to actually maintain that too. So it's not like you can just do it once and then you walk away and all is fine. Some that can change, you know, a, a request can come in and uh, the change could be asked and uh, maybe it didn't go clear, get cleared through security and then you reintroduced a, a new hole. And so you gotta, you gotta maintain vigilance on it. As you're doing, uh, for those groups that are doing merger and acquisition work, make sure you have a playbook in, in place and make sure you have you know, the top 10 things, the absolutes that should be on that list. And so as you're bringing in uh, you know, organizations, acquisitions and so forth, run those first, you know, those top 10 things. And, in, and that's the, you know, look where two factor is. It should be everywhere that is connected to the internet uh, and, and especially the VPNs and, and make sure that that's just, you got that in place. And the post, as you said, postmortems when when events happen, uh, we don't always know how mm -hmm. an organization was compromised. Sometimes that's released through uh, secure channels. Sometimes it's not. It, it's all dependent on the organization and and their willingness to share that. Uh, so, but you can you can learn the you can infer you know based mm -hmm. on how how the event has happened and and knowing what the common vectors are. So uh, just to be clear, you said even in a health system not going through m a there's tons of change and morphing. Oh, and then yeah. you add on m a and that exponentially increases the amount of change, correct? That's right. Yeah. So when you were talking, um, I wrote down process. You used the word playbook, mm -hmm. right? I mean, these are the things that are going to help you. You need to have process around when this happens, these things have to happen, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how right. we get our arms around these things. Yeah, and partnership with your supply chain organizations, your purchasing departments, your legal departments, your privacy departments. Those are all ways that you can keep tabs. Uh, so having official process. So ideally, if you have a, a, a new contract coming in, it's for technology or data services that should go through supply chain. A supply chain should have a fork that comes directly to you. Mm -hmm. And that way you don't have to go out there chasing everybody all the time. It's just, it's, in, it's embedded in the system. Uh, and then you have your checks and balances, you know, so you work with your, you build your partnerships with your privacy teams, your legal teams, and uh, especially when, you know, and, and you educate them on what are the things that you should be looking for. And sometimes they will trip stuff for you that might not have gone through the official channel for various reasons. Mm -hmm. So these are the basics, uh, you know, we were talking about. I don't know. I thought of the word exotics as opposed <laughs> on the other end of the spectrum. There's the basics, <laughs> the basic attacks and the basic defenses. And then I'm guessing there's the exotics. Um, do you have any thoughts around any of that kind of stuff that's like kind of really cutting edge and CI CISOs need to? This does the basic. We know yeah, how to do sure. this. These are some crazy things that are coming down the road. So you got to think about what the intentions of the threat actor are uh, before as, as you're as you're looking to defend against their attacks. So the majority of threat actors that are out there are criminal organizations that are looking to make money and they're doing that through extortion and extortion via ransomware, et cetera. They're going to go for the lowest drag pathway possible in order to do that. And that's why basics is the is the, the thing that you got to make sure that you're up to snuff on because if if you don't you don't have that in place. It's not hard for them to circumvent and overcome that. Uh, and and the idea that you know you're too small to be known by them that's just not true. I mean they they have they've scanned the entire internet. They've scanned everything. They know who you are, who's in your organization. They just know all of that stuff. So don't 
don't rely on obscurity, you know, as, as a defense me uh, measurement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the exotic side, I mean, we've seen elements of this happen, but it, it, it's all about, uh, for, for exotic attacks to happen, that, that means that they have to expend resources to do it, you know, and costly resources that hopefully get for a, a payout that they're looking for. So you got to think about well, what would that payout be for an exotic type of attack? You, you saw it with solar winds. That was definitely exotic, you know, where you're <clears throat> embedded malware into the build of legitimate software that was deployed, you know, all throughout uh, solar winds customers that happened, you know, December of uh, 20 uh, now, I, I believe it's two years now. And, you know, that, why did they do that? Well, they were going, they were targeting government systems, you know, as, as they were, um, as Russia was, was a Russian speaking countries were going for it. And, and that was very likely espionage driven, you know? And so it, you got to understand, you know, just sort of like, why would they come at you with an exotic attack? What, what do you have that would be of interest, you know, to, in order to expend those resources or, I mean, the, the, if you keep the, the lens in play here, as we get better on the healthcare side on our basics and, and we close down all those doors, and we make it, uh, we make it more costly for the attacker to come at us. They will pivot, and they will pivot, and they will get more sophisticated. They will expend those resources to get more, uh, to continue on with their extortions and so forth. And so then it's going to be, you know, more zero day driven, you know, types of uh, types of attacks. It could be more complicated social engineering attacks. We're, we're already seeing multi factor fatigue attacks coming in where you know somebody they 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 get your credentials they try to make us a, a a connection uh they can't get in because the multi-factor goes off and it goes off on your phone and when it's on your phone you hit deny but then they just keep doing it you know until eventually you you're you get tired of it and you go fine i'll hit yes and then oh boy then they're in <laughs> oh boy so that's that's gonna come you know there, we're already seeing that happen today and so fish resistant or, or like multi-factor resistant, you know, types of attacks are things that we, we're going to have to start considering in the next five years, because I, I, I see that happening more often um, in the future. Uh, so that, that's things, unfortunately, when you start, when you start getting into that realm, it's, it's less user friendly. So it's, mm, right. you know, it's things like UV keys, you know, where you have, it's a, in a way, it's going back to the hardware token that we had initially when multi-factor came out in the early 2000s, late 90, late 90s, uh, where, but, you know, with the UV keys, you plug it into your computer and that's your chip, you know, that's, that's the solid chip that, that you know, it's you. That's user-friendly from the sense that you can engage and work with a computer and it just happens, but you got to remember to carry it with you. And if you don't have it, then what, you know, and so you, you run into all these kind of scenarios that makes it a little challenging for the regular user to uh, to, to work. So I have a, a, a guy I know who's in financial services. And I remember you just reminded me of him telling me a story of how he had forgotten. Mm -hmm. I guess he called it a hard token to mm -hmm. physical. He had forgotten it at the office yeah. in New York and we're in New Jersey and he had to go all the way back yeah. to New York because he couldn't <laughs> work without it. So like you said, user friendly, but sometimes not so much if you don't yeah. have it. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's, and that's the rub, right, is like, how do you, you got to make sure that it's you that's connecting in and, and we do that via these proxies, you know, of multi factors and so forth. Um, I would say if you're, if you're using uh, SMS as your second factor codes being, you know, sent through a text message, that's also going to go the way of the dodo here in, in fairly short order. Um, there are attacks that can that can circumvent that. Again, it, it costs resources. It costs you know it costs the attacker to spend a little time. Uh, but there's things called SIM swap attacks and and such where you can clone the the SIM card and then have those messages you know relayed to a different uh, different phone. And so you know bypasses the whole process if when you when you do it that way. Um, you know you talk about everyone's a target. One of the things that I've heard, and I believe makes you a, a, a bigger target of a specific focused attack is probably research. 
um, if they think you're doing something, you know, nation state level interest in research yeah. around maybe COVID vaccines or whatever, that can really put a target on your back, so to speak. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, especially if your organization's uh, doing DOD level research or, uh, you know, they have federal contracts in, in place, that would be uh, a, a target of interest yeah. by... But now again, not necessarily criminal organizations in this case. Now you're talking nation states and espionage and and uh, IP theft. So different. You, you look at different countries that are interested in in doing that as they build up their economies. Right, right. So you, you almost have to operate as a CISO at at sort mm -hmm. of a different level when you're running that type of stuff. Yeah, it's a different risk profile, you know, mm -hmm. and so you need to have an understanding of what is that type of information? What are the contracts that you have? I mean, if there are federal contracts, then you then certainly there's very likely something you have with the federal government. And so what are the, the terms and restrictions around that? Um, what are, you know, if you're an organization that is like pharma or something along those lines where the drug that you produce is that is your revenue stream, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you get you get allowances with that drug before they become generics and you spend a lot of time in R&D. If you lose that mm. to somebody else who can just produce that elsewhere, that's a huge hit on your organization. So that's a, that's a very different risk profile. It's not locking up your systems through ransomware, it's literally competitive edge. Really? Uh, and and so not, not every organization is going to have that at that, that level of risk or that level of interest of that risk, but there are definitely some in this space in healthcare that, that do for sure. Right. Uh, third party risk, obviously very interesting topic. Um, you talked about not only you have to make sure that ent entity has good cybersecurity, but you also have to check the the VPNs that are coming into your organization, something happens, or what access do they have? Mm -hmm. um, that's that's fairly complex. I've heard people use the term, not only do I have third parties, but they have third parties, and they become my fourth parties, and then I oh, have yeah. fifth parties. And um, and it makes me think of that SBOM concept people are talking about. You know, With Log4j, mm -hmm. people didn't know if they had it or not. Mm -hmm. um, so the, what do you think of that SBOM thing in terms of it's almost like a list of ingredients on software? Would that be something helpful to security professionals when things happen? Yeah, so SBOM in particular is the first step in a, a first good step in a process for being able to understand the what's inside of these products that we get from vendors that the intellectual property essentially is the product itself. And so you don't get to look under the hood, you know, they, right. don't, they don't give you the ingredients inside of that, because again, going back to intellectual property and so forth. Uh, so, you know, when the log for js of the world happen, we go scanning our systems and we go looking for the vulnerability. And uh, depending on the kind of scanner that you have, it may or may not be able to detect it if it can't you know, get into the system itself. It can't authenticate into the system and look through the libraries and the software that's installed. And so it makes guesses on such, on stuff. And so the SBOM will, it, it, the intention of that is to sort of bypass that or rather give us the information up front so that we can just look for it in one place. Mm -hmm. the, the challenge, uh, the, the, the next step in the evolution of SBOM is operationalizing it within the healthcare delivery organizations. Uh, it is that we have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of products that are in our environment and being able to maintain the versioning of software in every single one of those at any given time is gonna be very challenging. Mm -hmm. you know, so think about it. You have an infusion pump that has version X, Y, and Z. Uh, you go out and do an, uh, an update to that infusion pump of X, Y, and Z. Maybe half the fleet has been updated and half the fleet hasn't. They have different versionings now of that software. And so you have to know every version of every pump of every place. Now compound that by every other modality that exists inside of a healthcare organization and you get yourselves a big problem, a big data mm -hmm. problem, essentially. Mm -hmm. So not not uh, there's there are folks that are working on solutions for this and uh, and and so hopeful that in the next five years or so we'll see something uh, come down that actually can do it at scale because this is absolutely a scale problem. Uh, like I said, SBOM was good. It's the first step into understanding and unpacking what's going on underneath it. 
Uh, but if you have to do that manually for hundreds of thousands of devices, you're, you're just not going to, you can't, it's just not enough. You don't have enough people to do that. Right. Right. Let's talk a little bit about business continuity. Uh, this is an area that I've been really focusing on, um, trying to understand what CISOs should be doing, what they can be doing. And organizationally, is there a missing individual or a missing role in terms of somebody not overseeing this process at a high level. And the process I'm talking about mm -hmm. is the process of, let's say there's a ransomware attack and the CISO in con consultation with the CIO determines that we need to shut down certain applications within a very short period of time. Let's mm -hmm. say the next half hour, the next hour, whatever it is, we need to take this stuff offline. And it may be uh, biomedical devices, as you mentioned, infusion pumps, but mm -hmm. something needs to come offline that people are using inpatient care and that type of situation. You know, that process for alerting the clinicians that are gonna be affected uh, from IT to clinical, that communication, who has to be told, and then somebody at a high level making sure that those individuals have practiced the procedures for receiving that information and going to paper. Who in a health system is making sure that's worked out? From my discussions, the CISOs take it to a certain point, but mm -hmm. are uncomfortable or don't have the influence or really it's not their role to be uh, making sure that the clinical side of the house knows what they're doing at that point. So yeah. uh, I'll leave it for you there. That seems to me to be an issue. Yeah, so this this should be in the basics, uh, the business continuity and your incident response plan, especially a large scale incident response plan and the drilling of that large scale incident response plan. So let me start by uh, offering some suggestions and solutions on how to do it and products that actually exist. So the, uh, one of the other things that I do is I'm the chair of the cyber working group of the healthcare sector coordinating council, which is the uh, one of the 16 critical infrastructure uh, with, that's been defined under uh, the National Defense and Authorization Act and National uh, in, National Infrastructure Protection Plan. Sorry, I threw a whole bunch of stuff out there. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Anyways, it's a federal. It's a it's a construct that says uh, industry and government have to come together when there's when there's critical infrastructure in place because industry actually runs, owns, and operates right. the critical infrastructure. Right. So within that group, we we have uh, just released a. It's called um, it's called the OCCI or Oxy. Uh, and it is a checklist that was built in partnership with emergency management folks, uh, cybersecurity and emergency management folks on how you connect your a cyber incident, a cyber um, a disruption in with your standard emergency operations. So every hospital has to have an emergency operations uh, organization and plan. Uh, you know, we have to account for physical disasters, fire, water, whatever. Uh, and, and so what you want to do as a CISO is connect into that process. You don't want to create something separate. And so your access in to downtime procedures and all those other things is through your emergency management department. So start there. And the, there's these things called incident command or hospital incident command, depending upon which standard you're using. Uh, there's structures of command that are already built as part of that emergency operations, emergency management process. And you want to leverage those processes. So you'll have an incident commander, you'll have logistics, finance, marketing, media, public affairs, legal, SMEs, and so forth. Uh, you build a plan, a cyber plan that accounts for, you know, what are the types of damages and impacts that can occur due to these kinds of ransomware attacks. Work with your emergency operators to figure out how you connect that into your, your um, incident command structure, build in the what if scenarios. You know, you need to be thinking about what at what point are you going to take down your systems? What's mm -hmm. what point are you going to proactively take down your data centers and so forth? What would be the trigger points that would enact you to do that? And it's that's a that's a super un, uh, um, it's very uncomfortable, you know, to to obviously be postulating that, but it you need to be postulating that before you have the attack and not making that decision on the fly. And then you drill it. So you, you go through this process, you, you need to involve your executive leadership in this, you know, certainly your COO, 
uh, if not you know other executive leaders, and you drill through the the thought process. Uh, take just take one of the things that's happened in the news and apply that to your organization. You don't even don't even worry about getting super complicated about this. About oh, I got to have every little attack vector understood in order to get to the you know to do a, a proper tabletop. You don't need that. What you need is to be thinking about what is the event that's occurring? How could this, this assume that it's going to occur to us, get people over the, the hump of, oh, well, that wouldn't occur because of this thing. And then arguing the, the scenario, you don't want to argue the scenario. You want to, you want to work, work the plan that the scenario should be helping you determine if the plan is accurate or not. Uh, and then, um, and get to that point, get to that trigger point and say, okay, how would we do this? You know, is it one person that gets to make that call within a period of time? Is there two keys that have to be turned in order to do it? What do you do if that person's on a plane somewhere or, you know, uh, un unable to, to make a decision? What's their delegate process? How do you go through all of that? Uh, and then, uh, then you just update the plan and you do that. You want to keep doing those drills over and over and over again, ideally until people are bored with it. You know, they're, they're like, oh yeah, we would just, we're going to do this. Oh yeah, we're going to do that. Oh yeah, we're going to do that. So it's muscle memory because then when you, when it's muscle memory, if, and when the event happens, you're going to be able to get over all the original decision-making um, burden and be able to manage the context of the specific incidents that you have in front of you. So you'll be able to leverage everything that you've worked on before. Excellent, Eric. Uh, I think, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. But uh, great stuff, great advice, and uh, really interesting stuff about that disaster recovery. So, I appreciate it, my friend, and I will talk to you again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.